welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here again today. Let's start off with saying that I really, really missed you guys very, very much. But wow, did I have a really hectic April, May. And I think I'm quite lucky in the sense that I have a very few but very close friends. And one of my closest friends actually got married in the beginning of May and now she has actually become family. But also, while I was with said close friend, at the end of April, we were busy sorting out stuff for the wedding. And then I got an email that I have been waiting for, for months. So we hopped into the car, we drove to the embassy, and we collected my passport. And since last year, June, I have been working towards getting this visa for almost a year now. But inside my passport, it said that I was finally accepted to work and live overseas. And this has been my dream ever since I went overseas with one of my other friends in 2018. And I really knew that this is what I wanted. And that's what I've been working towards since last year. But yeah, so that's just a little bit of an update of where I've been. Also, this room that we're in is absolutely chaotic. There are boxes everywhere in order for me to pack because I have to leave in the next couple of months. But don't worry, I'm still here. <laughs> But besides the catch up, the topic that we're going to talk about today is where you have a close friend, you think that you're close to this person, but do you really know them and what they're really capable of doing? But with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today we are heading over to Benoni in Johannesburg, South Africa. And in 1967, baby Jakobus Petrus Gildenes was born. Jakobus was an only child and his parents were quite strict towards him. Yes, they wanted the best for him, but they kept him incredibly sheltered as a young boy. The parents also kept their private life away from their son as well. For example, Jakobus apparently did not know when his parents' birthday was, when they got married, when they started dating, anything personal like that. Jakobus grew up in a very strict Afrikaans household and Jakobus' family made sure to put the fear of God in him at a very young age. Religion was one of the most important things in the Gildenese household and it took center stage quite often in conversations, how they would run their home and also how Jakobus was raised. And inside the home, apparently, Jakobus' dad was very standoffish towards his son and took more of the introverted parental role. Jakobus' mom was apparently very domineering. She was also the disciplinarian as well. But as a young boy, Jakobus was said to be a very well-behaved boy, very soft but very introverted and very quiet. And even though Jakobus' mom was very strict and very hands-off in terms of affection towards her son, she made sure that she was a part of everything Jakobus did. So if he went to school, if he was on field trips, if he went to a school camp, she made sure that she knew exactly what he was eating, what he was doing, who he was socializing with. She was very much hands-on in terms of seeing exactly what he was doing, seeing exactly who was trying to influence him. But she really paid any affection, apparently, towards Jakobus. And when Jakobus tried to make friends, even in junior school, even as a kid, she would cut this off. She would not allow him to have any friends, especially girls who were friends. She would cut this off and make sure that he lived a very isolated life. But what I guess is slightly out of the ordinary for this household, besides the very strict upbringing, was that Jakobus' mom was not only very religious, but she believed that the house was possessed. And she believed that everything they did that was bad in the house was based on the demons that possessed their house and she said that this demon looked either like little men or little demons that would run around the house and take things steal things and talk to Jakobus in his sleep but apparently the demonic possession got so bad in the house that they had to call a priest to come and bless the house and to just get this demon out but little did they know that the evil inside this house would be growing and it was not of a supernatural kind but then in grade five Jakobus became really ill and missed a lot of school, which caused him then to repeat the year. And this was absolutely devastating to Jakobus. Yes, he was very introverted. He did not have any close friends, but he was comfortable with his peers. And now that he had to stay a year back, he knew very little people and he was highly uncomfortable at this fact. So because Jakobus was now in grade five and now he had to repeat the year, he didn't know many people, he started to act out in small ways. And this would be to start bat chatting the teachers, start stealing things inside the classroom, pens, pencils, books, small things like that. And then his stealing started to become a bit more hectic. He would steal things from the teacher's bags. So he became a lot more comfortable in his stealing. But even though Jakobus was stealing, this was not exactly 
too bad in terms of mom and dad hearing that he was stealing. They thought that they could just discipline this out of him and he would be better. But then one day when Jacobus was still ill, his mom came home. And just as a side note, he was 12 years old at the time. So his mom came home while he was homesick and she walked into his room. She opens the door and there Jacobus is trying to self-pleasure. And his mom thought that this was the absolute end of the world. She disciplined him for days after she found him. And being incredibly religious, this to her was a massive taboo. So like I said, the discipline went on for days. He was punished in many ways. He was smacked. He was told to do a lot of things around the house as punishment. So he now developed this thing where he knew from a young age that he needed to hide things from his parents. But apparently throughout the years, Jacobus would continue to act out. He would continue to steal, back chat, anything like that. But then when he was in grade seven, it was time to get your year end report to see if you failed or passed. Apparently, Jacobus failed again. But this time, even though he had failed grade seven, because he was older than the other boys or other girls in his school, he was promoted to high school anyway because of his age. And they then just pushed him through to grade eight. And Jacobus then went into a trade high school where he would then finish school quite uneventfully. But if we go back to the moment where Jacobus was 12, and remember he was sick at home, and he was exploring and self-pleasuring, apparently that day, this left a seed of doubt inside Jacobus' mom's head. And ever since then, randomly, or especially when he became more of a teenager, more of a young man, she started pushing the narrative that he must never speak to women. Women are bad for him. Women are sinners. And he needs to make sure that he stays well clear of these women. And he should never be with certain types of women. Otherwise, his mom would never approve. So this was in young Jacobus's head the whole time while he was growing up. That these types of women are bad. This must never be in a woman. Women must never do this and that and this. So this was how young Jacobus was growing up. Now, if we go back to apartheid era, we know that the apartheid government censored a lot of information, not only about what was going on in the country, but also with regards to random things, small things like pornography and also anything that they deemed to be inappropriate. So I remember having a conversation with my parents the one time, not about por pornography, but about things that were banned during apartheid era. And they said that things like cartoons were banned or certain things that the government felt was inappropriate. So going back to pornography, when people wanted to buy this type of material there was a very limited section in what you could buy in terms of magazines so if we stay on this train of thought for a little bit Jacobus then left high school like I said it was quite uneventful and he got a trade high school diploma but when he left high school he then got a job as a railway police officer he would sometimes help out the South African police services but most of the time he was in the railways and within this job he was actually able to travel quite a lot not only via personal personal savings, but also work-related things that he had to do overseas. So when Jacobus would travel, he saw so many things that he never saw here in South Africa. So I'm talking about back now with the porn. So he would see so many different magazines. He would be able to go to strip clubs and to places where they had a lot of nudity. And his eyes were now widely opened about what he was able to see. And when he went overseas, he would then smuggle the magazines or whatever type of material he would bring back. He would smuggle them in. And he had quite a vast collection in his young 20s. But eventually, Jacobus was able to save and move out, and he then got his own little flat. And like I said earlier, he had a very substantial collection. So the one time his mom came over to his house, probably just to have a chat, and then she noticed his vast pornography collection. And she was absolutely shocked about some of the things that he was looking at, the type of material he was looking at. She said that it was incredibly rough and derogatory. So she then got a priest to come and talk to Jacobus and bless him and tell him that this is not the stuff that he needs to look at and that he really needs to stay away from this type of material to be able to be on the path that his parents and God wanted him to be on. So this is all constantly going through Jacobus. He, even though he moved out, his mom is still hovering, still telling him what to do, still telling him that the things that he's doing is ungodly and he will never be good enough for her basically. 
So anyway, we fast forward a couple of years and Jacobus, his mom and dad are now in church. It is Sunday and they are now having the service. And while Jacobus is in the church, he then looks around and he locks eyes with who he believes is one of the most beautiful women he has ever seen. And her name is Nadine. And in 1989, Jacobus believed that this lady was going to be his wife. Nadine was said to have an intellectual disability, but Jacobus didn't care. He wanted her. He absolutely thought that she was stunning. So Jacobus then, after church, went up to talk to Nadine. He then asked if he could have her home number so that they could chat. And then after that, it was kind of history. They, they went with each other to watch movies. They then went to each other's houses to watch movies and have snacks and all that good stuff. And so naturally, they started to date. So Jacobus was now kind of branching out. He now had his own place. He had someone that he really respected. He really loved. He was going at his own pace. But... This was not good enough. This was not good enough for his mom, his dad, Nadine's mom or dad. Nadine's dad actually took Jacobus aside and said, you're not doing enough. You're not providing enough for my daughter. You need to step up. You're only a railway policeman. You need to be better. And he then told them about a sergeant position that now opened up in the police services. And he said, you need to apply for that. You need to be able to make sure that you provide for my daughter. You can't just sit there and have this menial job. But this was not for Jacobus. He didn't want to be this in the police station. He was happy where he was and he could provide just fine for Nadine where he was already. But because of all this pressure, he felt, okay, let me just try. But remember I said earlier that Jacobus was incredibly introverted. He didn't like big crowds. He didn't like socializing with people if he didn't have to. And he just didn't like being put in situations that he didn't want to be in. But with that being said, he didn't get the job as the sergeant in the police. But with Jacobus, to be able to relieve stress on normal days when he was having a bad day at work or in hectic social interactions like this where everyone's forcing him and he has to do something he doesn't want to in order to relieve stress he would play video games he would go walk around the neighborhood and just to be able to get everyone out of his hair and just to make sure everyone is quiet around him but also another way that he would try and relax himself was to steal things and so then, on the 12th of May, 1989, Jacobus was playing video games at his parents' house one evening. Remember, he was a railway police officer, so he did stay by himself inside a police barracks, like where they had huge flats dedicated to police officers in all forms of that industry or in all forms of that job sector. So as we said, on the 12th of May, 1989, Jacobus is now bored. He's done playing his video games. He wants to do something a bit more exciting. So he then decides that he wants to steal something. So what Jacobus does, he then gets a ladder inside his dad's garage. He then puts the ladder against the roof and he then climbs up on top of the roof of his house. He then sees his neighbor's garden and he then jumps off the roof into his neighbor's garden. And as Jacobus jumps onto the ground in this neighbor's garden, the domestic worker who lived next door was coming out of her house inside the garden and she sees him, he sees her, and she then books it back into her house and she starts screaming. He then runs full speed towards her to try and shut her up now. So now this lady is screaming. She's absolutely petrified that this man just jumped in the garden and now is running full speed at her. He then pushes her straight onto her bed. He then starts ripping off her clothes, but she's not keeping quiet. She's continuously screaming and she's fighting for her life. He then digs under the bed. He then picks up a brick and he starts beating her to death. Once he had beaten her to death, he then leaves and he climbs back up the roof and goes back to his house and then continues to play video games like nothing happened. But as a side note, it is unclear whether the lady who was now murdered by Jacobus had been raped. Because after Jacobus was done, he then set her body alight. And like I said, after he was done, he just played video games and no one came looking, no one came knocking on his door, so he thought... Okay, cool, off the hook kind of thing about this now. So he felt a little bit confident, but he was still keeping his head underground. So time now went by, and then in April of 1990, Jacobus then knocked on the door of Nadine's father and asked for Nadine's hand in marriage. And when Jacobus came to ask for her hand in marriage, the dad said, no, you're not marrying my daughter. Get out of this house. You have nothing more to do with my daughter. You are lazy. You have no ambition. You have no drive, and you are not marrying my daughter. So Jacobus was absolutely heartbroken. He 
he loved Nadine and he really thought that he was going to marry her. He had the ring, but now her father said no and there was no chance that he was ever going to marry Nadine. But with what we're going to talk about later, maybe this was their saving grace and maybe this was the best. But from this day, Jakobus was incredibly angry. He was even more introverted at work. He kept completely to himself and he just spiraled. But then on the 2nd of November 1991, while he was still living in the police barracks in Norwood, once again Jakobus grew bored and he then decided to go out for a walk and hunt for something to do or something to steal. So eventually Jakobus finds an open window and he climbs through it. When Jakobus gets through the window, he then steals some CD players, some cash and whatever else he could find that was loose lying around the house. Now, as Jakobus has now stolen the CD players and all the loose items, as he's about to go out the window again, he kind of looks down and he sees that there's keys for a BMW vehicle or BMW car. And he then climbs out the window, he takes the keys and he then tries to find where this car is. And he then gets inside the BMW and he then drives off. But I think that Jakobus thought that maybe this wasn't exactly great because he was going to park the stolen BMW inside the police barracks' parking, which had just been reported stolen. So he thought that maybe this wasn't the greatest idea. So a couple days after he had stolen the BMW, he then returned it. And he kind of just threw the keys through the open window that was still open. But what happened next, I'm not sure if he was upset that maybe he couldn't get everything in the house from the house that he had just burgled, but he went back to the same house a couple days after he returned the BM. On the 3rd of November, 1991, he then re-enters his house. So Jakobus is now creeping around this home. He's having a look to see if he can steal anything else. And then he notices one bedroom because it's a single bedroom house. He then walks and he heads towards his bedroom. Now, inside the bedroom is a young, single female. She is fast asleep, but then she is awoken by something and she can't really explain it, she said. She just felt like something was not right. So she wakes up from being asleep and then she just lies there for a second. And then she feels like someone's watching her. So she turns over and there was someone watching her. It was Jakoba staring straight at her in the pitch dark. She just sees a silhouette of a man standing in a doorway. He then rushes towards her to put his hand over her mouth. When he puts his hand over her mouth, he then takes out a pistol and he then points it towards her face. She starts crying. She's begging for her life. She just wants him to go away. What do you want? Why are you here? Like, just leave. While Jakobus has his gun pointed at her face, he then starts taking off her clothes with his other hand. But while he's doing this, she then says, please stop. You really don't look like someone who's going to harm anyone. You look so sweet. And this was kind of the tipping point for Jakobus. And he then stops and he then looks at her and he's like, oh, you think I look sweet? You really don't think I'm able to do what I'm going to do to you? And he then basically says, let me show you how scary I can be. So Jakobus then starts smacking her around. He starts pistol whipping her and he then proceeds to rape her. But because Jakobus was so enraged, apparently later on, she would testify that he was able to perform sometimes, but other times he was not able to. And this really infuriated him even more. And she was the punching bag for why he wasn't able to perform. And she just kept getting punched. Once he thought that he was done, he then just threw the blanket over her face and then ran out the window that he came from. Then a couple weeks later, on the 26th of November, Jakobus is once again walking around very late at night, only looking for trouble. When he then is still in the Norwood neighborhood, but he's walking around and he then notices an open window on a ground story flat. He then proceeds to just climb through the window and he's climbing through the window and he notices a purse right there by the window. So he starts taking out cash from the purse and while he's there, he then notices the bedroom. So Jakobus then proceeds to walk through the bedroom Still pitch dark outside, no lights are turned on inside the house. When he gets into the room, he then notices an older lady inside the bed. Once inside the room of the 68-year-old woman's house, he then kind of nudges her awake because she still wasn't waking up. She then wakes up with an absolute fright because there's now this man sitting on the bed just pushing her to wake up. He then proceeds to point his pistol at this lady and tells her to keep quiet. He then rapes her twice that night. And then once he was done, he just threw the duvet over her face and then climbed out the window that he came from again. So Jakobus now is like feeling pretty good. He's like, both women haven't reported anything. The murder that I did a year ago or so hasn't been reported. I'm basically just going to get off scot-free. I don't need to worry about anything. And now he started to get quite cocky. 
because on the 16th of December 1991 still he noticed a beautiful lady in like a shopping area place and he then proceeded to follow her home so Jacobus follows her home and he then sees that she lives with another woman and a man but he waited he waited very patiently and he just waited by the bushes and just to see what was happening and I guess by coincidence or I guess by his luck the man and the woman left that night to go out somewhere and the beautiful woman that he saw was the only one according to him inside the house the woman that he was stalking was a 27 year old female and so Jacobus then got up out of the bushes he then proceeded to go towards the house where he then kind of moved one of the back sliding doors and it was unlocked so he then slid open the sliding door and he then walked into the home seeing what he could take first then notices a purse and he then starts putting the money into his pocket but the house is very dark and Jacobus I don't know why decides to then put the light switch on and because Jacobus put the light switch on, it awoke the lady who was sleeping inside the room, the 27-year-old lady. But she didn't really think much of it because she lives with two other people. She must have just gotten back to sleep. But Jacobus thought, okay, that didn't wake her. So he then walks to her bedroom and switches the light on there as well. This obviously woke her up. She saw Jacobus standing in the doorway and she then starts screaming. Jacobus then runs towards her, cups her mouth with his hand, and then points the pistol at her face. But she kept screaming, she kept fighting for her life, she was not having this, and then he decided to pistol whip her, but he pistol whipped her right at the back of her head, so she was in and out of consciousness, and while she was lying limp on the bed, in and out of consciousness, he then proceeded to rape her. Once he was done, he thought that because I switched the light on, she saw my full face, she can definitely identify me. So then once he was done, he shot her in the head with his gun. And then he left her for dead, sprawled out on the bed for her roommates to find. But as we clearly have gathered, Jacobus felt nothing about the people that he had just murdered, the people who he robbed, the people who he raped. He felt nothing for this. And then, only a couple of weeks later, on the 30th of December, Jacobus then struck again at a 27-year-old woman's house. Once again, he climbed through an open window, went straight to her bedroom, flipped on the light switch, and then proceeded to show her his gun, pistol whip her so she can be in and out of consciousness, just like the one before, and then proceeded to her. Once he was done, he said to her, get up and go wash. So she got up and she started heading towards the bathroom. But as she bent over to try and turn the taps on to run the bath, he then shot her in the head and she then slumped over in the bath. And she also stayed with another female roommate, but she was not home that night. So her roommate then came home the following day and found her dead inside the bathtub. But if we take a step back, remember Jakobus lived inside the police barracks in Norwood. And because he lived inside the police barracks, yes, he wasn't exactly a police officer. He was a railway policeman. But he would hear a lot of what the police officers were talking about, what cases they were working. And of course, they were working the Norwood as what it was deemed at the time by the media so he would hear little tidbits he would hear if they had suspects he would hear what they had if they had any dna evidence anything like that and according to him at the time they had nothing the only thing that they did have was a single fingerprint and boot marks that were coming from the window as the person was trying to climb in and out of the window but even though police were limited in terms of technology and what they were able to do back in the day, they still thought that something wasn't right. Someone must know way too much in terms of who the criminal was and that they must maybe live within the police barracks because all of these murders and all of these rapes were happening within the vicinity around the Norwood police barracks. So police then thought that just to be careful, everyone who lives within these police barracks needs to have their fingerprints taken. Because remember, they did have a fingerprint from one of the crime scenes. So they went around to everybody, took their fingerprints. But by some sort of luck for Jacobus, the day that he was supposed to get his fingerprints taken, the person who was supposed to take it just didn't rock up. So he got off scots free again. But once again, this just cemented to Jacobus that I have no consequences for what I've done. Everything seems to pan out perfectly for my crimes. So he thought that he could just continue and not get caught. But then he started to think about it a bit more. And he was like, OK, they keep talking about it possibly being someone from the Norwood area. So let me just leave this area. Then they have no chance of catching me because all of their sights are honed in on this area particularly. So Jacobus then asked for a transfer to be able to be transferred back to his parents' home in Benoni. And he thought here he could start his crimes once again. So remember Jacobus' ex fiance Nadine? One day he was going to visit Nadine, we assume, because he was in her area. But two doors down, 
from Nadine's house, Jakobus noticed an open window, and clearly to Jakobus, an open window means an invite into the house, take what you want and do whatever you want with the person inside. But Jakobus then notices this open window, he then climbs through, and this is the house of a 74-year-old woman. Once again, he's inside the house, he's rummaging through everything, and this rummaging must have woken the 74-year-old woman up. Remember, it's not during the day, this is at night again, so either he was coming home from Nadine, or he was stalking Nadine because his father would not let him anywhere on the property. But basically, he was in Nadine's area. He saw this open window. He's now rummaging through the 74-year-old woman's stuff. And like we said, the rummaging must have woken her up. So the 74-year-old lady now hears someone in her kitchen. So she gets up out of bed, but she can see that there's a light on in the kitchen. So she's kind of like squinting because she was in pitch darkness before. And now her eyes are adjusting. And as she gets within the door frame of the kitchen, Jakobus then sees her and now he starts running towards this lady she panics and she starts flinging her arms at him she tries to protect herself she tries to grab his arm and fight for everything she has because now Jakobus is running at her with a pistol so they get into quite an altercation but she has no match for this grown man's strength and unfortunately he then takes the gun once his arm is loose from her grip and shoots her straight in the face so he leaves the 74 year old dead for nothing for some cash that he found out of her purse which at the time according to some reports was less than a hundred rand but then for a couple of months Jakobus thought that the police are still talking about the suspect so he now just wanted to lay low a little bit because he didn't want any suspicions coming to Benoni now as well but then temptation was clearly way too high for Jakobus and on the 15th of July 1992 while he was still living with his parents in Benoni he felt that he was now going to jump over to a neighbor's garden and find something to steal so he then trots over to the garage he then takes his father's ladder outside the garage and he then puts it against the roof again climbs onto the roof and picks another neighbor's garden to jump off into sadly the garden that he decided that he was going to jump into was the home of a young 16 year old female who was alone at home at the time so Jakobus then jumps down into this garden. He then manages to shimmy the sliding door off of its rails and he then goes into the house. Once he's rummaging through the bottom of the house, the 16 year old who is upstairs hears him. He didn't know that she was there, but she then comes down the stairs and she then notices Jakobus and he notices her. He then pulls out his pistol and he threatens her that he is going to kill her if she doesn't keep quiet. So she does. She's only 16 years old and she's absolutely terrified. So he then tells her to go up to the bedroom once he's up there he, he still has the pistol pointed at her face but he then pulls her pajama pants down and he then proceeds to rape her once he is done she's absolutely crying she's got tears running down her face he then points the gun at her face and then shoots her straight in the middle of the head but now these two bodies had been taken to the morgue to be autopsied but by some sort of coincidence the other doctor who had performed the autopsy on the other bodies in Norwood did the autopsies in Benoni as well and he immediately informed police that the same person who was in Norwood is now in Benoni doing the same crimes so the police in Benoni and the police in Norwood then joined forces to try and get the suspect so what the police did was they thought okay we assumed that the person was in the Norwood police barracks at first let's see if anyone was transferred in the last couple of months to Benoni and they figured that there were two suspects who had been transferred in the last couple of months and that was some other police officers officer and Jakobus. So Jakobus happens to be at the Benoni barracks that day, the Benoni police barracks, and he hears police talking about how there's some constable coming from Norwood to speak to Jakobus and some other guy that day. So Jakobus now panics and he then heads into the armory within the Benoni police barracks and then switches out his service pistol for another one. And then the constable who was actually there to talk to the other guy first because they thought that he was more of the suspect but it just so happened that he was out on patrol that day and he wasn't even there. So by pure luck Jakobus was the guy that they interviewed that day. Jakobus then sat down with a constable and apparently a detective from Norwood and they started talking about what could have happened and why he was potentially a suspect but Jacobus just said nothing he pleaded the fifth he was not going to say anything but the detective who was there was actually really irritated he was like I didn't come all the way down here for you to just plead the fifth you are a police officer you know exactly what we're doing so you coming with me to Norwood and we're going to take some fingerprints so Jacobus was quite taken aback he didn't expect that he was going to be dragged to Norwood but he was and they then took his fingerprints they then sat him down in an interrogation room and they said listen here 
we just took your fingerprints and we took some fingerprints from some of the crimes that were committed in Norwood and Benoni. And you know what? Your fingerprints match. So Jakobus was then instantly arrested on suspicion of murder and of rape. But because of all this pressure and because all these police officers were looking at him, glaring at him, like, how could you do this? You're one of us, you traitor. That he eventually apparently confessed because he, he couldn't handle the pressure of his peers looking down on him like that. So he confessed to all the murders, to all the rape to the burglary, and also to switching his pistol inside the armory in Benoni. Just before the trial took place, Jakobus also went for some mental health testing, but he was given the all clear. They said that there was nothing that would stop him from being fully present for the trial. So then, on the 24th of September, once the trial concluded, Jakobus Petrus Gildenes was found guilty of five counts of murder, three counts of and robbery, and of using a vehicle without the owner's permission. In the end, Jakobus was sentenced to five life sentences for the murders, three life sentences for the rapes, 12 years for robbery, and just over two years for using a stolen vehicle. And just as a side note, Jakobus was actually sentenced to death, but as Jakobus was sentenced to death, the government at the time then changed the laws that we were no longer allowed to have the death penalty within South Africa. So he is still alive and spending the rest of his life behind bars. So that was quite a case, but let me know what you think of this case down below. I hope you have all been very well. I missed you guys very, very much. But please stay safe out there. Close your windows, lock your doors, and I'll see you again next week. Bye. Bye.